In 2013, Nintendo was in a different place. The Wii U was struggling to sell units and by September, it had received a price cut. And during the same month, Nintendo announced their new 2DS hardware. On face value, the 2DS seemed like a strange move. Like the unpopular Wii Mini, the 2DS had functionality removed. Now, this may not seem like a big deal, especially if we consider the Switch Lite. But in 2013, Nintendo never really removed features from hardware revisions at all. With the 2DS, gone was the 3D functionality and the ability to close the handheld. The 2DS came on a slate and it was aimed at a younger audience. Hardware-wise, the 2DS shares almost identical specifications to the 3DS. It retains the same dual-core ARM11 and single-core ARM9 CPU chips, 128MB of main memory with 6MB of graphics RAM. Included is the 4GB SD card and 1GB of internal flash. The 2DS comes with a 3.5-inch display that's capable of outputting 400 by 240 pixels and the lower screen is a 320 by 240 resistive touchscreen device. The system has 2.4GHz wireless networking built in and is fully backward compatible with the Nintendo DS and DSi games. The 2DS was released in October of 2013 and initial reviews were mixed. No one really knew what to make of the 2DS. It was ridiculed in the press and by the public. But the system has stood the test of time very well. Its initial price was $129.99 in the US, $40 cheaper than a 3DS. And when it received a price cut to $79.99 in 2016, it had sold extremely well during that holiday season. By 2018, the 2DS has sold around 10 million units and while officially not at its end of life, Nintendo has moved all its focus on its hybrid Nintendo Switch system that has been a huge success for the company. So I recently picked up this Nintendo 2DS on Labor Day in the US for $39.99. GameStop was having a sale on all refurbished 2DS systems. And because the 2DS is just a 3DS, albeit in a different form factor, that means we get access to the Nintendo 3DS homebrew library on the 2DS. The last time I bought hardware from GameStop, I actually had to repair the device myself. If you recall, my Nintendo Wii had its power button snapped off and I ended up soldering it back on myself. So I was interested to see what type of condition this 39.99 2DS would arrive in from GameStop. The packaging is about what you would expect from GameStop. I love how they just rested the power pack on the touchscreen without any screen protection. When I took the 2DS out of the packaging, the first thing I noticed was how grubby the unit was. But first things first, let's power up the unit and make sure that it works. And surely enough, it does. Now the next thing we need to do is clean this thing. For this, I just used some isopropyl alcohol and a cloth, and I scrubbed it pretty good. Now that's looking a lot better. And of course, we need to try out a game. Yep, that looks to work fine as well, so let's get into the business of modding this device. First of all, it's important to understand that the 3DS is compatible with DS and DSi games, but when you insert a DS cartridge in a 3DS, it's effectively in DS mode, which means that you have no access to any 3DS features. If we try to use our friend, the R4i Gold Card that's compatible with the Nintendo DS, DSi and 3DS, if you watch my DSi video recently, you may recall that the R4i Gold Card worked, but it did not support any of the DSi features. And the same thing applies here. You can use an R4i card, but you'll only get access to DS Homebrew. Now this in itself isn't a bad thing as there's some pretty good stuff available for the DS as we've looked into before. But the 2DS or 3DS is quite a bit more powerful than the DS, so we definitely want to find another exploit in order to take advantage of the 2DS hardware. From the release of the 3DS in February of 2011, the homebrew community was looking for ways to exploit the system. There were some initial attempts made in 2012, but nothing really came out of it. In 2013, the Gateway 3DS flash cart was released. This cartridge did not support homebrew, rather it was a piracy tool to play 3DS ROM dumps. But in December of that year, some users reverse engineered the Gateway 3DS to play homebrew and release an open source version of the payload. Gateway 3DS didn't like this and updated their firmware to brick a 3DS if they noticed that the payload was tampered with. The problem was, this also affected legitimate Gateway 3DS users. It seemed like Nintendo was winning the battle against Homebrew ever appearing on the 3DS, 
until November of 2014, and this little-known game known as Cubic Ninja changed everything. A 3DS hacker known as Smealum released Ninja Hacks, which was an exploit found in the 3DS game Cubic Ninja. The exploit was found in the level editor of the game. By use of the QR code scanning feature in the game, it's possible to scan in and exploit a level which overflows the fixed length buffers and leads to custom code execution of the homebrew loader. At the time, Cubic Ninja was the only way to run homebrew on the 3DS and copies of the game were selling for hundreds of dollars on eBay. Fortunately, since then, many different methods of exploiting the 3DS have been found. What's interesting is for this video research, I went back to see if Ninja Hack still works on my 3DS, which is at firmware 11.6, and surely enough, it still does. But since Ninja Hacks, there's been many advancements in the 3D homebrew scene, and it's really not used that much anymore these days. Tube Hacks was an exploit found in the YouTube app, which was patched soon after. Then there was the mighty ARM9 loader hacks, which was permanent and gave users complete control of the 3DS and ran a custom firmware. Sound Hacks was another exploit, this time using the Nintendo 3DS Sound app and an M4A audio file that had an overflow in the metadata tags. Sound Hacks was also the first exploit that was offline and completely free. Luma 3DS is another custom firmware that's still very popular today, which has some great features including region-free support and of course homebrew. But we're only scratching the surface here, there are some very comprehensive write-ups about the entire 3DS homebrew exploit history out there, but I felt it was important to set the stage. For this Nintendo 2DS that we have here, we are going to use the newest and preferred method known as Bannerbomb 3. So the method that I'm using to modify my 2DS is known as Bannerbomb. Now this particular method and other methods to modify a 2DS or 3DS is in a comprehensive guide that I will leave a link in the description below known as 3ds.hacks.guide. And that will give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to modify a 2DS or a 3DS for it to run homebrew. Bannerbomb 3 is a nod to the Bannerbomb exploits from the days of the Wii, but that's where the similarities end. Bannerbomb 3 works by dumping the DSiWare exports via an exploit of the data management section in the settings application on the 2DS. But in order for this to work, the 2DS's system encryption key is needed to build a DSiWare file that will perform the exploit. And in order to get this key, a tool known as SeedMiner is used to calculate this key. This key takes a very powerful PC to generate, and there is a website that will perform this for you. It only takes a minute or two to generate the key, but once you have it, you can then set up the Bannerbomb exploit. Incidentally, setting up the exploit took me around 15 minutes from start to finish, if you follow the 3ds.hacks.guide. It's pretty simple. So, with our $39.99 GameStop 2DS, once we've set up and are running homebrew, what are some of the cool things we can do? Well, first of all, the emulators. SNES, NES, PC Engine, and Genesis emulators are all very well represented here and are a step up from the DS. Super NES especially runs at full speed most of the time, except for Super FX games. But with the bigger screen and resolution of the 2DS compared to the DS, most of the 8 and 16-bit emulators out there will look and run great. Then we have the ports. There is of course Doom. It's here, it's free, and there's no Bethesda.net login needed, and the music plays at the right speed. The port of Quake is very good too, runs at a great frame rate, and has no issues at all. Then there's even a port of Quake 3. Now admittedly, this one runs a little slow on a 2DS, but with a new 2DS would handle this port better. Still, it's impressive to see Quake 3 running on the 2DS handheld. Next up is eDuke32. Oh yeah, Duke is back baby. Well, he never actually went away. This is Duke 3D we all know and love. Incidentally, I tried to see if the new Iron Fury game would work, as that would be really fun to play on the 2DS, but sadly the game crashed. Hopefully this can be updated someday, as Iron Fury does support eDuke32. And then there's Zash 3D. That's right folks, Half-Life on the 2DS. Who would have thought? Again, it's sluggish at times and probably needs a new 2DS, but who would have thought we'd even see Half-Life running on this hardware? I'm impressed. But this isn't all. The 3DS is very well represented in the demo scene and one particular demo that caught my eye that's recently released is known as Skate Station. Check it out for yourself.
We mentioned emulators previously, but one system that has issues with emulation is Game Boy Advance. But there is another way to play Game Boy Advance games with a tool known as the new Super Ultimate Injector. This tool will allow you to play popular classic Game Boy Advance games and can be loaded from the 3DS home screen. With this tool, all you need to do is add your Game Boy Advance ROM file and then add the title image and metadata and create what's called a .cia file. And with a homebrew utility known as FBI, you can install this .cia file and then launch the game from the 3DS menu. This is a simple and cool way to play Game Boy Advance games and every one that I've tried has run perfectly. I could go on for another hour, but you get the point. On this cheap 2DS, Homebrew is awesome fun to play around with. The community has some fantastic emulators, ports, games and utilities, and it's complemented by the brilliant 3DS library of games available for the system. There is truly something here for everyone, and if you are interested, I recommend taking a look at the world of Homebrew on the Nintendo 2DS. So there you have it guys, that is Homebrew on a $40 Nintendo 2DS. It's amazing to see the amount of awesome Homebrew that's available for the 2DS and it's a definite step up from the Nintendo DS and DSi Homebrew stuff that I was looking at earlier this year. So if you do find a cheap 2DS or 3DS out in the wild, consider picking it up for Homebrew because there's so much cool stuff that you can do with it. There's amazing utilities, games, emulators and ports that you can play on the 2DS and of course Course, it complements the amazing library of games that are already available for the 3DS and 2DS systems out there. So yeah, if you find one out there, guys, check it out. I think you'll really, really like it. Well, guys, I'm going to leave it here for this video. I want to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Did you think this was a good pickup for $40 and getting homebrew on the 2DS? Do you have homebrew on the 2DS and 3DS? Let me know what your favorite homebrew is that you like to use because I want to check out more of this stuff on the 2DS for sure. And let me know in the comments below if you enjoyed this video as always don't forget to like and subscribe and i'll catch you guys in the next video bye for now